Okay. So on, on Wednesday's lecture, we barely started uh, a lecture on, on fluid power systems. So this will be pretty fast. This is definitely not going to get through everything you could possibly learn about fluid power systems. But it's, it's basically to give you the main flavor of what's going on with fluid power systems. And so the main reason why fluid power is important and it's distributed power. Okay, so what we mean by that, I should probably increase the font size, right? That's way too small. Okay, now it's stuck. There we go. Okay, so the main reason for fluid power is distributed power. And so just to kind of give us an idea, if we have a force applied to this piston here. What's going on? Okay, there we go. So we have a force applied to this piston here, and we have some sort of area of this piston. All right, we know that P is equal to F over A. Oh, no. P is equal to F over A. And so what this does by applying some sort of force in one location distributes this force um, all over this vessel, right? So this one kind of looks like a swimming pool. This is or some really crazy pool, maybe underground cave. You probably wouldn't find anything that's engineered that looks like this, but this is, a, this is the basic idea in more of a schematic form. So the principle behind this is Pascal's law. Fluid at rest has the same pressure everywhere. Um, obviously, you're probably looking at this in fluid mechanics class. You realize that this is not 100% true. As you go down in a water column or fluid column, the pressure gets, gets higher because of the weight of the fluid above it. But this is, in general, for smaller systems, fairly true and acts normal to the walls. So what this allows you to do allows the engineer to route fluid lines to a location of interest. Okay, so for instance, an example of this, that's, I think is, a, is an example where why this is so convenient. If you take, for instance, the fluid power system in your car, there's your brake system. All right, so if you wanted to have a brake system in your car that is composed of a bunch of mechanical linkages, to basically route the power that you're putting in your foot, and then for, therefore it's going to be the power brake as well, the power you're putting in your brake to brake your car, in order to be mechanical linkages, you'd have to have these gear systems or levers running through your car, and you have to get around your exhaust and everything else in your car. And that's actually fairly difficult to make a system do that. But the fluid power system allows you to basically just run these uh, hydraulic, hydraulic lines and take the power that goes Right. So from a single actuator, you can actually drive a, a four different loads here. Um, and then, and so that's a very, I guess, efficient way to design things. 
that you can route power very easily. If we're talking about liquid phase fluids, we call this hydraulic. And if it's uh, gas phase, we call this pneumatic. Right. Yes? Yeah, so we'll, yeah, we'll, we'll talk a little bit about that. Um, okay. These are very mini versions. We'll pass these around. These are very mini versions of the ways that we can give the system power. Uh, pumps and motors, uh, but hydraulic pumps and motors, not electrical pumps and motors. So we, yeah, we'll, we'll talk about that in a little bit in terms of how that's actually done. Yeah, because it's not you know, a really you know, a thousand pound man you know, pushing on the brake to stop a, a front end motor, right? Yeah. It takes more than that. Um, so, capable of extremely high power densities. Thank you for this lead. So, here's an example of an earth moving piece of earth moving equipment. All right, so, everyone's probably seen these on the side of the road. Anything that has requires really, really high power densities, you do not see uh, very commonly um, electric motors driving these. Right? Or even gas powered motors with mechanical linkages, these are fluid power systems. Uh, precisely because what you can do with fluid power systems is you get amplification of your, of your power in a fairly efficient way. So just to kind of show this idea in terms of amplification, say we have some sort of cylinder in one location. Okay, so I have a cylinder in one location and I have some sort of piston in this system, and I apply, say, something like 10 newtons of force, and say this area of this piston is one meter squared. So this would be a very large system. One meter squared is pretty large. And then by just clever design, engineering design, what I can do is have another region of the system that has a larger area, say for instance this one, A is equal to 25 meters squared, and with this I can lift a mass that's then 250 newtons. Okay? So just by geometries you can get amplification of force. And so this is from the fact that if I apply force in this area, I'm going to get 10 over 1 meter squared, though that's 10 pascals. That's going to apply pressure everywhere in my system. So this is going to act normal to all these walls. Okay, so if my pressure is equal to 10 pascals, I then multiply this by 25 and I get a force here of 250 newtons, right? So you get amplification. So this would be an example of 25x amplification. Just by changing geometry. Yes. Yeah. 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 Exactly. So same thing, you can also think of gearboxes have the same idea, right? You can do torque amplification with a gearbox, but you get less distance travel. Yeah. So think of it in terms of work balance, right? Work is force times distance. So it's not going to just generate work for you, right? Okay. Um, also capable of high speeds. Who's ever had a cavity before? Dentists use this really 
high-pitched drill on your teeth, right? Okay, so this is, these are usually, um, <clears throat> not all of them, but a lot of them are air or pneumatic powered. Okay, so a lot of these are capable of really high speeds. So these are pneumatic powered drills. Um, your teeth are made of basically ceramic-like materials. You need to have really high drill speeds to drill through those. So this gives the, the, the dentist a really high speed rotation at the end for drilling teeth. Okay. So this would be an example of just another fluid power system that has a capable of really high speeds. Another example of really high speeds, who's ever been on top of a drag strip in Dusky, Ohio? Right? This is a, a fluid power driven system. Okay, so they needed an extremely high power density to fly this thing up 400 some feet, right? And so it's a, they use a fluid power system as an example. Um, other examples. Here's kind of a non traditional one. Uh, not all UPS trucks, but a lot of UPS style trucks, these uh, shipping vans, are fluid power driven systems. Okay, so we think of cars as. Um, Anything that's a vehicle, like semi trucks, cars, as being uh, oftentimes um, being just you know, electrical, or sorry, IC engines driving mechanical linkages. But many of these uh, uh, UPS trucks are fluid power driven systems. And then this one is fairly interesting. So this is an experimental work by UPS and some other people who are doing research. It is a hybrid fluid power uh, fluid power shipping truck. So. We'll get into what accumulators are in a second, and we'll talk about those motors and pumps. But just like you have a vendor in a very uh, hybrid, hybrid, uh, hybrid vehicle, like a Toyota Prius, which allows you to store some of the energy that you don't want to use the heat and freight, you can actually use a fluid power system to, uh, and a pump to then charge an accumulator by what it is again. This would be the uh, hydraulic analogy to a battery. Okay, so you can actually store pressure in, in regions of a, a fluid power system, and then they can use that later. So they're not losing all that energy just to braking. They're actually storing some of it in the fluid power system. There's some kind of, this is, you don't really see these driving on the road. This is still in the research phase. But there are kind of clever ways in which people are using fluid power uh, in the recent years to uh, gain some sort of engineering advantage on the system. Okay, so let's get to the elements of a fluid power system. If we look at a general fluid power system, we have some sort of hydraulic or pneumatic line coming into the system. So we're going to be talking about elements. So just like in the electrical systems, we're using different elements, resistors, inductors. Uh, we didn't use any capacitors in our discussion. Um, but you have seen that in other classes. That's another electrical element. In a fluid power system, we have elements. So this is a generic element. We'll get into what these look like in a second. And so in any generic elements, we are going to have a pressure drop or a pressure rise across it. Okay, so tying this to your electrical system analysis we did, what and what what would we usually have across an element in an electrical system? Voltage drop, right? Okay, voltage drop or voltage increase, right? So here we're going to talk about a, a pressure drop or a pressure increase across fluidic elements. Um, and so we'll get to tying together, you know, which are the analogs of each other in, in a second. Um, for all the systems we talked about, but in general, we're going to talk about having pressure drops or pressure rises across the system, and then we're going to have volumetric flow rates through an element. Okay, so we talked about electrical systems. What quantity did we talk about going through an element? Current, right? Okay, so instead of current in this example, we're going to have fluid flow rate through something. So this is volumetric flow rate. So if we say then we have pressure, This would be delta P is equal to P1 minus P2. The delta in electrical systems, we talk about delta V. That was in volts. Here we have delta P. That is in units pascals. And then we have volumetric flow rate.
And this is in units meters cubed per second. Okay, so pressure is always in reference to something. Okay, and I think you've probably seen this in your fluids class. So this would be the unit, this would be the, uh, a pressure reading here. This looks like a pressure gauge that you may have seen in other engineering systems, which is basically a dial. This would be recording pressure at this node. So pressure is always referenced to something. Okay, so you've probably seen this in your fluid mechanics class. When we talk about pressure, you can talk about absolute pressure, you can talk about gauge pressure, right? So we could say that, okay, right now in this room, I'm at one ATM, right? That's relative to, to uh, basically a vacuum, right? Or you could also say that we're in the room, we're at zero pressure, right? In reference to atmospheric pressure. Right? So same thing in fluid power systems. Um, we almost always are using fluid power systems in atmosphere, so we're usually going to call it zero pressure, atmospheric pressure. Okay, so motors and pumps. So the question before was, how do we get so much pressure in a fluid power system? Uh, using basically motors and pumps. Okay, so a pump is a way in which we convert mechanical work to fluid work. Okay, so the gen generic symbol for a pump is simply just a circle. It has an inlet and an outlet. We'll talk about just one inlet, one in out, one outlet for this. And then we have an arrow. And if you notice that this arrow is going out. So an arrow going out means it's a pump. So arrow. Direction of flow. And if it's a filled arrow, hydraulic. And if it's an open arrow, pneumatic. Okay, so in this example, what we're showing here is we have a pneumatic pump because it's a open arrow. So this would be then the flow rate for the system. Okay, so we also have hydraulic motors. Same uh, symbol is very much the same. Oh, sorry, I forgot an element on the pump. So you have a shaft going into it. So it's the shaft. I have some examples here. I hope this becomes clear when I pass them around what the shaft is. And so then a motor would be an arrow going the other direction. And because the arrow is filled here, this would be a hydraulic motor. This is fluid work converted to mechanical work. The motor. Okay. 
So I'm going to stop right here. We're going to go through some examples that I'll pass around to give you an idea of motors and pumps. So a motor in a pump, just like we talked about with electrical motors, we can use an electrical motor as something that converts electrical energy to mechanical energy. That's in its motor form. Or we can use it as a generator, converting mechanical energy into electrical energy, like the alternating your car. Right? It's just running the system in reverse. So same thing with hydraulic systems is that they can be either pumps or they can be motors, depending on how we run them. So the first pump I want to show here <coughs> is this, this big one here. So I'm going to pass around paper towels, too, because this thing still has some grease in it. So, and the other thing to explain, this thing is really heavy. So don't worry, it can't come apart. So don't just like throw it at your neighbor. Right, they may get a gear in your face or something like that. But this is a gear motor. So you can pull this thing apart. You can spin it if you want. You don't mind getting your hands dirty. But some, some few basic elements on this. <coughs> You'll notice this has a shaft, right? This is either you can drive this with say an electric motor or an internal combustion engine. And then it's going to drive the system and it's going to cause fluid to flow, or vice versa, you can flow through it, fluid through it. And the shaft will then convert that fluid energy into mechanical energy. So the basic idea behind this is you have two gears on the inside. And so what the gears are doing, this is this case where this is being used as a pump. And so what you're doing is you are having either a motor, an electric motor, or an IC engine turn this gear. If I turn this gear, it's going to turn this gear as well. What that's doing is it's drawing fluid in on this side. As this gear rotates, the fluid moves around, and then ejects out the outlet. <coughs> so you're then driving fluid with this uh, pump system. Um, the opposite case is you have fluid going in this side. It's then going around here, and then it's converting by the, the pressure of the fluid, putting force on the faces of these gear teeth, who are then causing with pressure to be then transduced into uh, torque on the shaft. Yes? For both these generators, wouldn't there also be some sort of backflow of the fluid that would then be blocked by the right hand side to bring it out to the contact with the So, where are you seeing so that great voltage in here? Yeah, like on, right on the left side. I think, like as it's turning, the fluid is being pulled through the back of the right. Uh, Again, I'm missing the. So I think the, there is going to be little eddies of fluid not going in the exact direction you want, especially at the teeth interface. Because, especially as, say, for instance, we're going in this direction, right? You're saying here, it's going to get squeezed into the ejected out. Wow. So, so I agree, there are going to be certain areas of this gear motor pump that are going to be counterbalanced, but as a whole, basically drive through the system. Yeah. There will be areas that are not going to control the water. So I'll pass this around. Again, I remind you it's heavy. Don't throw it at your neighbor. These gears come out too. So they're fairly heavy. So don't throw anything at your neighbor at all. And it's greasy. So. Um, then the one on the right is just a variant on this. Uh, this is an example. The one on the, the what's on the board matches almost perfectly with what's being passed out. Oh yeah, if something falls out. You don't know where it goes. Just like throw it away. <laughs> it won't be used for anything. So, uh, so this one's a slight variant on, on on this version here. You have this internal gear that's spinning. This one, this diagram is not 100 percent clear, but you have this little channel way which allows fluid to go over top of this. Again, become entrained in between this blue gear and this purple gear. As you spin this motor, this outer ring spins as well, and then that causes fluid to go around. So it's tough to see because these down lines are tough to see, but this is out of the plane. So you're just kind of passing way above the gear. Um, Bane motors. 
This will probably be most clearly seen when you spin this. So this has a plexiglass front to it to kind of see what's going on. But what we have here is we have an off-center uh, pivot point. So we have this cylinder here, this pivot point off-center from the center of this outer assembly. And then it has these veins in here. And these veins are spring-loaded. So you probably can't see it because they're kind of a dark color that blends into the, the base of this gear. But as you spin this motor, you see these little veins when it's closest here, the spring of the vein is almost perfectly, it's almost purely uh, inserted into its slot, and as you rotate, it expands out and fills the gap. All right, so that keeps fluid from flowing past the system. What this does is it draws in fluid because you have some sort of volume, the volume is expanding as you go around, that's creating a slight vacuum as you go around, and then as you get to the top, then it starts to kind of compress it, it's pressurizing by creating a vessel which is getting smaller and smaller until you then inject a nice high pressure. If I pass this guy around, you can see I'm moving. You can also watch how these veins are sliding in and out of the slot, expanding or contracting. Or Okay, so this last one I'll talk about is um, always the most difficult to explain, so bear with me here on this one. Okay, this is a axial piston pumper motor. There's a video that I'll show as this goes around, but what's nice about this is you can have variable displacements with these type of pumps and motors. Um, I don't think there's going to be sound on this, so I'll kind of talk over what's going on here. Not sure why the video is choppy. Okay, this is just listing all the components of it. We'll get to the meat of what's going on in a second. Okay, so let's, let's talk about what's going on here. Okay, so I'll, I'll pass this around so you can see what's going on. This is one with this, what's called a, a thick wash plate angle uh, pump. And so that means this angle here, this is this wash plate, this angle is always fixed. Right, so there are ones that you, you can have additional degrees of freedom, but you can change this angle. And what's going on is that we have a set of pistons here. And we have a set of pistons. This is at an angle, and these pistons are tied such that they follow, the end of the piston always follows the angle of this wash plate. So as I rotate this shaft, what's happening is the piston is fully inserted in this location. As I rotate it away, the piston is now going out, and therefore you get fluid to flow into the system. Okay. This rotates around, so this is fully now open, so you can it, and then as you, uh, sorry, I said this wrong. The fluid coming in is fully expanded here in terms of that it's filling in the vessel, and as this rotates around, it's being compressed or they're pressurized, and so it comes out to an outlet for the pressurized part. So, in terms of this video, Okay, so here is this example coming in, collecting, pressurizing, and then ejecting. Right? So because of the angle here, we have this change in displacement as the fluid goes around, therefore changing the pressure inside the system, thereby pressure. So here's an example of how the variable wash plate works. So you can change the amount of pressurization by changing this angle. This one that half up, let's do this. What I would encourage you to look at here is that as you rotate this shaft, you see that these, you have these set of pistons, you can see how the pistons are either inserted more or less inserted into the cylinder as you go around. The 
you can also look into the inlet and outlet, which is on this side, and you can see as they pass around, each cylinder is becoming exposed to the inlet and outlet. Okay, so then the question was, you know, how do we create pressurized systems? So in the So if the example of this caterpillar front end loader here, a caterpillar front end loader would have an internal combustion engine on this, and then it would be driving a pump of one of these types. I'm not sure what caterpillar uses for this, but they'd have some sort of pump of that pressurizes the whole body. Are there like Yeah, so there definitely are efficiency differences. So um, I'm not going to go through those in detail, but those are actually in the notes. So there are kind of rough efficiency values for each of these. So gear motor pumps, the lowest efficiency of these, and then axial piston pumps being the highest efficiency. All right, so there, I, I hope you can also appreciate the complexity in them too. The gear motor pump is fairly simple. It's basically two gears in an assembly. Um, other pumps, say the vane motor one, has these vanes that are spring loaded that have to go in and out. It's a very precise machine that's more complex. And then the actual piston pump has the most number of moving parts. The most complex of all of them, right? So there's differences in efficiency, there's also differences in how, com how complex the systems are, which adds to expense, maintenance, etc. Okay, the other type of fluid power system that you're probably familiar with is the cylinder. So a, a cylinder has this basic symbol. I don't have a cylinder that I can pass around here. But you basically have some sort of vessel that can store fluid. You have then a piston and you have an inlet right so by applying a force to this piston I can pressurize the fluid in this in the cylinder or by using a pressurized cylinder I can create mechanical work by moving this piston right and so I think this is clearly shown on the side of the caterpillar front end loaders, these are using the cylinders as motors often, where we pressurize the cylinder. This causes this, um, this uh, piston to then extrude out, and then that can move this arm of this front end loader. If you want to know what's inside of one of these pistons, this is an example of a dual acting piston. So we can move this left or right. You basically have uh, chambers, this chamber, this chamber here, and then by having a pressurized fluid, if the pressure in this side of the chamber is higher than the pressure in this side of the chamber, the piston is going to move to the right, and vice versa, if the pressure in this chamber is larger than this one, it's going to then move to the left. And so, it the and so again, it's conversion of mechanical work to fluid work or vice versa. Um, just real quick before we get into the valves section, that example we just showed in the PowerPoint was a double acting cylinder. This would be single, and then double acting.
simply just to know that you have two different inlets to the system there, the double acting solder. Okay, so the way in which we control basically pressure going to different regions of a fluid power system is, is valves. Okay, so we're not talking about the symbol for a valve usually has this little handle on it. It makes it look like you know, the spigot to your to your hose outside your house, right, where someone manually turns it by hand. It's obviously not that simple. You have some sort of system to open and close that valve, whether or not that's solenoids or it's some sort of motor or something, but we're basically changing the resistance in some region to then change the pressure drop in, in this area. Okay, so by changing the resistance, we can either change the flow rate or the pressure drop. Um, and so we'd have valves throughout a, a system that is modifying pressures throughout. So I'm not going to go into all the specifications on how you uh, um, basically, there's, there's an entire, we could spend the rest of the entire class, not today's class, the entire class, talking about all these different types of valves and, and how we specify them, but that's more on the, the technician level. We're going to talk more about systems analysis in this class because of the nature of the class. Um, I used to have a valve that I would throw around, put, uh, uh, show around in class, um, but I don't know where it went. It was stolen from me or something. I don't know, but this is a, uh, a pneumatic, or sorry, hydro yeah, pneumatic valve that I used to show around, and it had uh, three different, oops, three different regions here. And so this allows to change one. The this was primarily was used to change the direction of flow in a system, not necessarily the resistance to flow. But we use valves in these systems to then change pressure, which then changes how the system actuates in terms of different configurations. All right, the last basic element I wanted to talk about is something called an accumulator. So I, I alluded to this in, um, we talked about the hybrid, uh, hybrid UPS truck, but we have also pressure storage units in a system. Okay, so the most basic is a tank, right? So, for instance, a swimming pool, right? Anyone who's ever dove to the bottom of a swimming pool realizes that the pressure is higher, as you can feel in your ears, at the bottom of the swimming pool as it is at the top, right? I think it's a pretty common observation. And so we can store fluid in some sort of water column to, to store energy, right? So by storing, basically using mechanical work or fluid work to press, push, you know, Hydraulic fluid or water to some sort of high level in a tank, we can store pressure that way, therefore store energy. The other way in which you can do it is something that's not so obvious, but something, an element called an accumulator. And so an accumulator has this basic schematic. We have some sort of pressure reading at the bottom. And it looks like this balloon type structure. I'll, I'll talk about why it looks like a balloon in a little bit. But it's a pressurized vessel. And this is the basic schematic. I think it's most easily seen in terms of what the actual structure of this looks like by looking at other schematics of this. And so what an accumulator has is it has a bladder on the inside. So when you 
hybrid UPS truck. You can store braking energy into an accumulator, so then when you want to accelerate back, you can expel the pressure from here to cause your truck to accelerate. It also needs to be used for riding systems. Basically, just like a capacitor and electrical network, it can allow us to smooth out transit and use this energy fuel to potentially have a These are other elements that you may not have seen before, but these do appear to be a lot of third parties. It's also, I guess, worth noting that um, any system has capacitance associated with it as well. So think of like balloon animals, right? You blow up a balloon animal and it stores pressure in that, you release it, all of a sudden the balloon animal goes flying away, you're converting stored energy in the form of pressure into some sort of kinetic energy when the balloon animal flies away. So even though hydraulic fluid lines are usually pretty rigid, made of steel and really dense rubber, they actually store energy in themselves as well. They, they, they do bend and flex, they store energy in the walls just like this accumulator does. Okay, so that was a kind of a quick run through some of the elements. Any questions on those? Okay, so everything here is uh, based off of some sort of, has some sort of basis in fluid mechanics. So if we look at fluid flow in a pipe, so here is a, a section of pipe. Have you gone through the terms laminar and turbulence in your fluid mechanics class yet? You have? A little bit? Okay. So in general, if we're talking about hydraulic fluid, it's fairly viscous, and we're oftentimes talking about fairly small vessels, so we're usually talking about laminar flow. And so by laminar flow, that means we have a fluid flow up in a circular cross-section pipe. That means that the fluid flow profile has the no-slip condition at the wall, therefore it's zero velocity at the wall and highest velocity at the center. Okay, so fluid flow is resisted by friction. Okay, so you've gone through terms like viscosity and fluid mechanics already, right? So any type of flow going through a pipe or some sort of vessel is going to have some sort of friction associated with it. It's going to have losses associated with it. Um, another thing is that a fluid flowing has inertia. Okay, so this fluid has mass, it has a certain velocity, therefore it has momentum or inertia. Same basic idea. And so when we talk about fluid flow in a pipe, we're going to often say that it's going to have some sort of resistance associated with it as well from the fact that the fluid has viscosity. So if I look at kind of a schematic of the pipe, we would say that I have a pressure drop across this pipe as fluid flows. So I have volumetric flow rate going from left to right in this example. Pressure drop or P1 is higher than P2. And so then this is going to have a fluidic resistance associated with it. Right. So then our, we're going to oftentimes be looking at electrical circuit analogies of this fluidic system. So we're going to represent this section of pipe 
as a resistor. Right, so normally in an electrical system, we talk about voltage drop across the resistor and current through that resistor. There's a pressure drop across that pipe section, which has resistance, and fluid flow rate, volumetric flow rate, through the resistor. As fluid flows through this pipe, we have a plug of fluid that's flowing. We have some sort of volume of fluid that, fluid that is flowing. That's going to have inertia to it. And so inertia, electrical system, we demonstrate by an inductor. That's inertia in electrical system. Okay, in a fluid system, call it, instead of calling this an inductor, we call it an inertance. Okay, so I have about one minute left here. In this last minute, I wanted to start to draw some analogies between all the types of systems we've looked at thus far. And I'm not going to be able to get through this, but let's just go through the most basic one, the most basic element right now. So this is going to be a whole list of analogies. Okay, it's not going to let me do a tab here. That's kind of annoying. But, but if in a mechanical system, we have a potential variable. And that is force, right? So we look at mechanical system, we talk about force balance, right? Force on either side of an element. And we have a flow variable and this is velocity. Okay, so we'll fill in what this is for electrical and magnetic system in a second, but just for a fluid system, just to make this clear, the analogies potential variable is pressure. And then the flow variable is flow rate. Okay, so we'll get we'll get to these uh, we get to we'll fill out the rest of this on Monday, and we'll get to two examples on Monday as well that use these basic ideas here. Have a nice weekend.